we will try episode 38. Once again, thrice, twice yes. we were thwarted, thrice we shall try. Welcome to Vinyl Junkies episode 38. Hola, como estas? Kim's not here. Say something, Grant. Yeah, Jumbo Jumbo, Kim. We miss you here. We miss you. She's off doing weddings. I hope it's not too awful. And those of you uh, that are actually watching this probably watched us do it three times. But you know, that means that we're probably just nailing the start of this. Oh, we care. We, we do, care. we do. We give until it hurts. But um, <laughs> not a whole lot we can do, folks. We're doing the best we can with the technology. And hey, there's no producer. So uh, apologies if it doesn't come out right. But uh, because Kim's not here, what I thought we would do is just make a topical thing and see what you guys thought. So uh, lots of different music gets discussed in uh, the Vinyl Junkies group, doesn't it, Mr. Austin? I love it, man. It's it's where we go to find new music. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you get to know the various players, the ones who like the reggae and the ones that like the African music and the ones that like the funk and so forth, right? I think see myself more of a, as a generalist than anything else tries to kind of dig deep into every area but you man you're just one of those guys that my man in africa man and you're from north carolina correct yeah that's right so let's pretend i didn't ask that to you already another tw another two times but all <laughs> this is to say that um how does a guy from north carolina uh collect music from africa on vinyl it's a good question it's uh, i'm a i'm a musician i i used to play in town here uh and i have a lot of musician friends so i love music great and you know i used to listen to a lot more metal and a lot more um uh rock and and I, at a certain point i i actually came across it kind of uh, accidentally, uh, you know, it was one of those things where I found a bunch of African stuff at the PTA store in Greensboro, and uh, you know, it just looked cool. And it was some Kenyan stuff, and it was some um, Nigerian stuff, some juju, and some. So you Benga. just found it in a thrift shop. It was literally. It, this was 15 years ago, and I found a bunch of cool records that were 50 cents a piece, and it was stuff that I'd never seen before, and never heard of, and really fascinating looking and i was like Let, yeah five bucks i can i can take home 10 really neat looking records let's do it see i find it interesting because for me um what is it that you know finding i'm pretty sure anybody would pick those up in a thrift shop right oh yeah but definitely. but the thing is is that the transition between picking those up at a thrift shop and where it is that we know each other now through the vinyl junkies forum and seeing somebody like yourself i see your posts and it seems like they're almost um uniquely african you go very deep or at least more than i do and generally speaking i mean when we're talking about the music world we think of people like Aegon, right uh at now oh, yeah. again and uh, you know they're great curators and there's a lot of great labels that curate strut for Absolutely. example but um it's so fun I'm, yeah i think i know where you're going here I, yeah I, i'll tell you i'll tell you why i fell in love with african music how about Go. that do it because 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 it made me happy dude it made me happy it it's 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 overwhelmingly happy music and i was in a really bad place in my 20s like i i had some some serious tragedies and it was something that instead of reveling in that those feelings it was like liberating me and sort of opening my eyes to this world where, you know, and the more that I learned about it, the more I, I thought about it, I was like, Africa is a very complicated place. There's a lot of, of you know, through through the 20th century, there's been a lot of fun. <laughs> in Africa. And it's like, I... Uh, Can I tell so you something? Much? No, don't tell me what. No, I really do. I really have to. This is pretty awesome. Oh, okay. I don't buy clothing, okay? I don't fucking buy clothing. I'm just, I'm a peasant. So um, I'm feeling particularly happy these days. So what I did was, I had a pair of jeans that were about to become dust. I decided, I've had these things for 15 fucking years. It's time to get a new pair of jeans, Grant, you understand? So what yeah. do I do? I'm a big shot. Straight to Walmart. 
Find a pair of jeans. Okay. I'm a fat guy. You can't go to fucking boutiques. They don't make boutiques for me. You understand? You go to uh -huh. Walmart because Walmart, you can get fat guy jeans. So fat guy jeans, they're nice. They fit beautiful. I was very proud. First time I buy a new pair of pants in 10, 15 years. Then I see these shirts. And I figure, you know what? I look really good in Hawaiian shirts. So I figure... The show makes me happy, just like you were talking, right? Just to tell you that I'm not off on a tangent. I'm actually going somewhere, Grant, and okay. you're the one who put me there. All okay? Right. Happy. So what I did is I bought this bright fucking Hawaiian shirt. It's got flowers on it. It's blue. It's festive. It I've makes me it. feel like I good things are happening, right? Yeah, so my wife... I count on her. She's kind of my producer. She tells me when we sound bad, when we don't. She leaves she leaves little notes for me. So she leaves me a note. Okay, both of you are clear. That's good. Right after under that, she writes, you have a $12 tag on your shirt. We all see it. <laughs> With a big old LOL laughing at me. So basically, um, we've been on for six minutes, and I got this $12 tag on my shirt. And um, rather than kind of get embarrassed to take it off, it's... Um, now You're you know. Rock that. This I, show is yeah. We're on take what three? You're gonna rock the tag. Right? Yeah, dude. I'm. I am that. <laughs> just to tell you, I am that kind of fashion icon. Okay. Oh, I know. Trust me. I watched the show. I said. So this so, shows. <laughs> so, okay. If we can make this show worth thirteen dollars, maybe fourteen, so we get out of the bad luck numbers, <laughs> we're good. We're good, right? Yeah. Well, are you a numerologist? Guys, man. Are you a numerologist? I'm bringing back this. I'm bringing this back to Africa my way. Are you a numerologist? No. Okay. Oh fuck! The joke would have worked only if it was fourteen. I was going to talk about the fourteenth, and today's the fourteenth. So one number outside of the bad luck, and the fact that Sun Ra was a huge numerologist and was somebody that very much enjoyed playing. Um, Live at the Pyramids of Giza, at the steps of that. And that launches us right into Africa. And you know what? Can I tell you some? Can I tell you how I got into Africa? I'd love to hear it. You would? Um, yeah. I actually liked it so much that I decided to do a little um, clip thingy uh, that shows the picture. No, oh, did I put it up? Okay. Yes, here it is. Check it. What I put up on the screen is this picture. This is this, this, this carousel that's going to change, but there's a picture of an album called The Indestructible Beat of Soweto. Oh, yeah. I believe it was on the Shanaki label. The Shanaki label uh, was a predominantly right. reggae label, but they did a lot of African stuff. What okay. a great label that is. Oh, right. Man, oh, man. I would kill to have all that stuff reissued because it was excellently curated. So, uh, it was the tape section. I would buy tapes and I would buy uh, CDs at the time. No, actually, wait a second. The 80s was tapes and vinyl, some CDs. They were too expensive, but there was a tape there. And there's this guy who's wearing, you know, those uh, tennis uh, visors, those green see-through tennis visors, kind of like off to the side. And this is like in the 70s, right? So way yeah, before right. any hip-hop culture, he's got it off to the side. And he's down crouched and he's just giving the devil horns. And... um. It was the coolest looking thing ever. And just based on the cover on there, I have to buy this. Now, I had bought Shanaki, but I always, re uh, or Shanachi, whatever, but I always related uh, the label with uh, Bunny Whaler records and uh, African stuff. But this cover, like the guys, one guy's just pointing at the camera. He's got a yellow pair of pants, right? And, oh, they're uh, tough. No, it's a oh, yeah, they're tough, the, tough these. Cover. You know, they're fucking dirt poor, but these are tough-ass motherfuckers. You're serious, man. For $3, I had to take the ride. So I take the cassette, pop it into my Walkman, and uh, transport it into some fucking country-ass shit that I'd never heard in my life before. And, um... Did it make you happy? It confused me. I was a metalhead. I bet uh, yeah, but I I, I was a metalhead who really needed just who was too curious and needed to hear whatever caught my fancy, and these yellow yeah. pants and this you know this black guy down with the the devil horns, fucking yeah I had to find out so I'm hearing this country ass music and then inside two, uh, sorry song two comes in and literally as the song is going on you hear some hens clucking in the background. 
Like it's it's in there. I don't know if they kind of like I don't know if they looped it in or it's just you hear hens clucking in the background. I kind of doubt that they looped it in. I mean, maybe they did. And it was the most mind blowing thing, and my head hadn't wrapped around that at all. Okay, so I can't say I like that. I can say I bought it, and I found myself playing it. But I found myself playing it as a curiosity. Uh, almost. Are you familiar with uh, Trout Mask Replica? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you know, you know, kind of like the first time you hear Trout Ra Mask Replica, replica and <laughs> you don't understand it. That's that's a deep, yeah, non-understanding for me that first time I listened to Trout Mask Replica. Yeah. So that was an indestructible, indestructible beat of Soweto. Okay. And um, the chicken just got me. And here we are, what? fucking 20 over 20, 25 years later i'm talking yeah. about this cassette because it marked me that way and uh, where it connects to vinyl is that i've been looking for that bloody record on vinyl since forever and i really want a copy and on top of that i actually passed up a copy once and uh lo siento man i really uh i'm sad i'm sad because i, I wish i had it so <laughs> somebody needs to release those. it right yeah we've all passed up those records that we we needed to get that time Okay. Um, well, okay. So, let's see. So you, you're, that means your introduction was South African, which is really a good way to start. But for me, it was in West Africa. Okay. The stuff that I really started to like. Once I got that initial grab, I started to pick out a couple things, and it was high life music. And I don't know if you know much about high life music. Sure. I don't know if anybody. It, that's watching the show knows a lot, but I, I, I just fell completely in love with I Life music, and it and it's like Evo Taylor, you know, um, Pat Thomas. There's a million like cheap love me some Pat Thomas, Olewa, and like you know, there's there's so many. It, basically, High Life music is this uh, music that was that sort of bubbled up from the twenties where. The, the Africans would go and like peek into the high life shows, the, the high society shows. And they would hear this sort of swing and dance stuff, mm -hmm. but they, they weren't allowed to go in and they basically were like, fuck this, we'll do it ourselves. And so they, you know, use their own instruments, made stuff and just use their own rhythms. And it became this, fantastic style of music high life and that's for me where i kind of had an entry point where i was like okay i get it like this stuff um is right on and I'll, let me show you one of my favorites let me see if i can find it so i love pat thomas i think that you have a pat thomas record i was I just had. about to segue into a right. pat thomas story i'll let you finish yours and i'll go right into it buddy yeah i i have I have just about everything Pat Thomas did from about 71 to 80 or something. And that was a crucial time period for his career and for high life music in general. It became very funky. Um, it was, you know, it became fusion-y just like Afrobeat. But um, Pat Thomas was something that I connected to deeply. I'm a singer. And so his voice... You know, that was something for me that, like, and that was another connection with a lot of African stuff was the way that they sing is so, uh, they have, there's, so, there are beautiful voices all over Africa. And it's like, you're going to take me just totally different than what Dude. I was used to listening to Western music. Okay. Well, now I got to get excited. I'm sorry because now you led me to a story and it's not that I'm interrupting, but, no, um, this, this entire conversation, okay, uh, you and me have been planning this Africa show for a good while. Now, um, Ethiopian music is something I was familiar with, but uh, it's like any other music that I... Uh, I bought this yesterday, okay? And what I'm doing is I'm showing Mulatu Astatke. Uh, Astatke, is that the way you pronounce it? Astatke? Right, okay. yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I know a lot of African music from compilations for the most part. And... Um, Vinyl Me Please just came out and released Ayalu Mesfin, right? right? And that's so this Ayalu Mesfin was unrecorded stuff, a collaboration that they did with Aegon at Now Again. 
and it's this Ethiopian artist, and it's all stuff. They compiled some seven inches and uh, never re uh, before released stuff. And the guy was very, very connected to the music. So they sent this. And for me, it's like it was a ballsy move. What they did was just basically took a chance on something, and it did very well, right? But the story that I wanted to get there uh, to is the liner notes. Uh, are very, very deep, very, very researched. And that's the kind of thing you can expect from now again. And reading through it, um, you learn about how uh, this music from this area was uh, created from slavery. Basically, the first uh, band leaders were slaves and the horns were given uh, to uh, to the, I believe, general, uh, who uh, Haile Selassie, right? Right. Okay, That's we're right. given to the general because Italy tried invading uh, them twice and failed. And um, the uh, I think, sorry, I think in fact, I think in fact, Ethiopia might be now. If if I'm not mistaken, Ethiopia might be the only African country that wasn't colonialized. Yeah, I, I, I think that. I, the thing is, is look, I read through the notes and all this is to say that it was fascinating, but I recognized something in his voice, especially in this single, ah, there was kind of this thing that I had recognized from elsewhere. Now, when you read this, a name kept coming up, Mulato, uh, Mulato Astatke. Okay, the name kept coming up, but the thing is, is where African music gets very confusing for me and is that... Uh, the names are hard. Very often they're long. They're hard to pronounce, so they're harder to memorize, right? So coming to the individual artists becomes difficult. Compilations is an easier way in. But what I did was, knowing that we were coming to this show, I went to a record store. What do you do in a record store? You buy records. Mulato Astatke is there, right? Ethio Jazz. Yeah. Dude, I put this thing on, and... I knew, this, you, I knew you were going to talk about this the whole show. Dude, no, it's listen, so it's just, good, right? this This doesn't even sound African to me. This just sounds like a badass jazz record. I knew you were going to love it. You sent me the picture this morning of you with it in your lap, and I was like, oh, shit, this it is to be about Ethio Jazz. It is not great. even, it is not even, I don't even relate relates to it on an African level. I just listened to it, and you know what? If I got a blind listen and just played it, it's like, are you fucking kidding? This is just excellent jazz. It it's got this kind of like yeah. crazy wah-wah in it. So it's yeah. very psychedelic also. Well, it's But it's also like very like laid back, like vibraphones, the wahs, the, the you know, like the, the organ, you know, it lays. And here's another cool thing. Well, I, maybe not a cool thing. Let me, let me restate that. So, so. In the 70s, when 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 Mulatu and like um, Hailu Mergia, the, they were playing out the um, <clears throat> the Durge regime in Ethiopia had set a curfew, and so at 12 o'clock doors were locked, and so people would go out to these shows, and they would be locked in until six in the morning, and so these jazz sessions would go on just all night long. They wouldn't get out until the morning time. And can you imagine being in a in a in a club where you were just locked in? You can you know you could either get arrested or just stay and hang out and enjoy the place and have them play for hours and hours all night long. I mean that's the, that's sort of the environment that this this Ethio jazz Mulatu Estadke like you know was fueled by by um, that sense of like we're let's do it all night kind of thing you know what i mean can you feel that in it um i feel a groove that uh caught me on a loop listen i listened to the thing three times i haven't had it i've had it less than 24 hours <laughs> right all right and uh, it's a short record but um i like i didn't know what i was buying okay i just bought it because i knew that i could talk about it and try to render some so, so, some idea at least of what this Ethiopian music was, uh, how the word jazz fits in, how it connects to Ayalu Mesfin, and how it connects to a whole bunch of compilations where it's really where I got a lot of my uh, love of African music, right? Yeah. And um, 
I come to realize as I wake up right away, boom, come downstairs, put the thing on again. I look for another record, and this is the second record. There's a fr there's a uh, the first record that's also uh, been reissued by Strut Records, and um, now I gotta find that. That's gotta happen immediately. I don't have that either. I'm I am I I want that record very badly. It's Do you have any Mulatu? Yeah, I have the one that you're talking about. I don't have I don't have the first one. The Ethio Jazz with the Mulatu Estake and featuring I can't remember featuring I have that one, but I don't have the first one. Featuring And I passed it up. I passed it up. I saw it at the store and I If I like, can pronounce his name properly, Mulatu Estake featuring Fecade Amde Mascal. Okay. Uh Look, it's a mind-blowing record, and yeah, I will definitely get the other one. As a matter of fact, I just did a quick search, and uh, look, we take great uh, pride in our pop market store. I know I do. I really take great pride in it. It's something new, but um, one thing that we decided when we were going to do this, now that we have this space for you guys to actually go and look for these records that we're talking about, is um, we wanted to make sure that they were records that were available, Okay, and we wanted to make sure that they were records that we actually own. So we're not just talking about anything. We know you guys, when you go out there, you're buying these records. You're spending real money. Okay, so what are, uh, when we talk about the records that we do, they're records that we have. If we don't have them, we can't talk about them. Okay, so putting the store together, I went back because right away it's like, oh shit, I got to buy some stuff, right? And uh, the, f the first Mulatu record is available. That's how I know it's available on Strut. And uh, there's something else that's available, which kind of takes us a bit off the beaten path. But um, compilations, I had mentioned, a lot of compilations uh, got me into the African stuff. Um, one wasn't even by way of just necessarily the African um, filter. There's um, a label called Q... DK, I believe, media in uh, Germany. They put out a um, series of compilations under the title of Love, Peace, and Poetry. Okay, and they put this, and I, I'm actually showing it right now on the screen, so the viewers can see the covers. And okay. the one they're seeing right now is this yellow one, and it's African psychedelic music. They make a whole series of them. So there's Turkish, there's fucking even Peruvian, there's a Brazilian, there's American... And there's African, right? Uh, I have 10 out of the dozen that are out, or 8 out of the 10. I'm missing only two of them now. But uh, the African one uh, introduced me to music from Africa, again, unlike what I was used to. And what it is that I always um, associated with Africa was, um, I mean, obviously you've seen the movie When We Were Kings, right? Right. So so it takes you back to stuff like Fela and it takes you back to just Afrobeat and the infusion of funk and the infusion of James Brown, really. James Brown just taking music all over the world and just turning it on its ass and bringing Africa into America. And at, on the other hand, just influencing Africa with his American music, just bringing the polyrhythm back you know, and um, that's always the way it is that I associated it. Uh, indestructible Beat of Soweto, even then I kind of considered it almost like a folkways record. You know, that's to say that yeah. it's, uh, it's a document that, you know, somebody like uh, Lomax would record, you know. Sure. So not sure. necessarily musical, but more a question of capturing the culture type of thing almost right. like an archaeological or not archaeological but anthropological music yeah. anthropo uh, yeah. anthropology um that's where i thought it all was and as i got further i started discovering bands like are you familiar with suck mm -mm. dude this band out of south africa they were just completely pissed off at the fucking not being able to live freely uh, wanted to call their band Fuck, but they decided to just do Suck and under tremendous pressure wind up recording nine songs that's just some of the most out there psychedelic hard music. Hard, hard, hard psych. Sweet. From the early 70s and it's a record that hasn't been reissued in forever. And uh, that was on the Love, Peace and Poetry uh, soundtrack and that's where it is like, oh... 
now there's something else here that doesn't necessarily have to do with the James Brown or the Fela Kuti that I was used to. You, you know where I'm going? Yeah, yeah. I don't have that record. I'll have to check that one out. Uh, it's something else, man. It's very... If you can find it, the thing is is that it hasn't been reissued and it very badly needs a reissue. The record's called Suck It and See, and they very much uh, went out with the idea of trying to just piss everybody off and Tell be me what the, raw. It's like, it sounds compilation. like Black Sabbath, dude. Some of it. Really? Some of it. Tell me what the, the compilation was that you had. Love, Peace, and Poetry. When you watch okay. the show back, you're going to see that there's a... Uh, comp uh, there's, there's just a, a, a carousel of pictures of uh, women in bikinis with like the psychedelic writing and okay. uh it's a really excellent series of records and they're cheap man they're not expensive and i made sure that uh, we're gonna throw all that up in the pop market store uh massive value for the dollar like i said i think there's 10 of them i'm missing two of them i'm missing them i'm not telling you what i'm missing but i'm missing two of them okay <laughs> but i have africa and i have turkish the turkish one and i got the japanese one and um it's well, well, well worth seeking out. All right. It kind of takes us a little bit off, but um, bring us no, back no, to Africa, cool. brother, man. Well, hey, okay. So let's see here. Let's, um, why don't we talk a little bit about Afrobeat? That's an easy one. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, right. Why don't you start I mean, that? Get into that because that's. I think a lot of people get into African music from Fela Kuti, and that's all the better. There's really not a better avenue to get into it than, than that. But no. um, I know you've got you've got a bunch of Fela, right? I do actually. What I did was I uh, put up the um, I put up the box set. Uh, I mean, I'm pretty oh, sure yeah. that everybody knows the. Fela Kuti box sets that were put out by Knitting Factory. There's four volumes of them. The first volume was uh, Questlove, and that's the one I got because it contained the records that I wanted most. I came yeah. across Fela uh, through funk, man. Through funk. I just kept hearing polyrhythm, and funk music made it so that, okay, I gotta go check this out. And I wasn't doing vinyl then. It was CDs, and they weren't easy to find. So I had to yep. go to my local record store, Sam the Record Man, and search and pay like 30 bucks for a Portuguese import of, um, and I didn't know what I was buying. The covers kind of looked similar. I didn't know what I was buying. And I was going to spend 30 bucks on this Portuguese CD. And what it is that made me decide is one record was called Expensive Shit. And it's like, okay, well, I got to know what this is, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's Expensive Shit and uh, he miswrote on it. And uh, put the thing on, and it's like... And... Um, that has Water water Get No Enemy on Yes, it, it does. Yeah, yeah. That's, exa that's the third it's one on it. Yet. And it just goes on much longer than I'm used to. So it's like right. 13 minutes, 14 minutes, 15 minutes. And it's like just three minutes before the horns even start coming in. You know, and it's just boom, man. It's got that energy. And yeah. it's like, now I understand why. And I went about buying everything I could from Fela. Back then, like I said, it was difficult. So, uh, you know, a couple of those $30 CDs, uh, when the box sets came out, immediately. I saw that there. One of the other albums that I had bought is um, Teacher Don't Teach Me Nonsense, which is a later record, but he's still, he's not Egypt 80. That's much later. That's the end of his career. But yeah. teacher, don't uh, teach me nonsense. And um, I think there's even a, a document. There is a documentary on Fela for sure. But I think the documentary is actually called Teacher, Don't Teach Me Nonsense. And yeah. um, that one, that song is what twenty one minutes long, twenty eight minutes long. Well, and, those, you know, he would he would go into the you know his whole i idea after he had sort of established himself was to play these long sets and his his live shows became more ceremonious but his albums you know they're often one two or three songs you know very long drawn out things and he would record them basically the week before he wrote them uh, the week after he wrote them kind of you know within a, a month or two and then he, he wouldn't play those songs again and he'd just go on 
And so the the neat thing about Fela's catalog is that he you can just follow his life by listening to those records. And yeah. they came out so frequently, it was like, what's going on? And it, you know, it started out less political. It became a lot more political, as you know, probably just because of the 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 chaos that had sort of uh, um, uh, umbrellaed him in the mid seventies. You know, but. Um, no, they're, 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 it's, it's an amazing catalog. It's one well, of the greatest catalogs you know, in the, in the history of the world. It kind of does so, bring, it does kind of bring, uh, sorry, I'm not trying to interrupt you. I'm just trying no, to no, dovetail no. it into a really cool story. Uh, it kind of dovetails into this idea of the curfew you're talking about with the all night jams, because Fela had his own club, of course, and that's those types of all night jams were happening. And, uh, you know, the stage was a one foot stage really right there. And yeah, uh, like, like you mentioned, they were really very, very big ceremonies. But uh, what would happen, obviously, is because he was out as outspoken politically, uh, the Nigerian government would just crack down on him and try to find any way to arrest him or just harass him. So yes. they beat people coming out of the club. Um, the song Expensive Shit is actually about uh, one of the times that he was arrested and thrown in jail. What happened was that um, they arrested him for no reason at his club and uh, they planted some um, hashish or marijuana. I think it was hashish that they planted on him. And what they were going to do is they were going to bust him and uh you know basically arrest them on false charges on their way to being carried there there was somebody else who was i guess another thief that they were rounding up to get processed who was sympathetic to uh what fela was all about and what he did was swallowed this hashish right and uh when they searched him they were fuck there's no hashish here uh, you know what happened? We f we know you're there. We know you did. You know you have drugs on you. No. They so what waited, they do? They waited on his shit. That dude. Waited. I'm going there. That's the <laughs> okay. fucking punchline. So what happens is they're there. No, fuck you. We're gonna get no, you. You weren't. swallowed them shits. You swallowed it. So what he did was they ordered Felakuri to take a dump so that they can break it up and find this piece of hash, which they never found because somebody else swallowed it. So he wrote the song about how they went through this entire process, which was very expensive, and it's called Expensive Shit. So well, that's, that's what the song is about. That's, yeah, no, it's great, because there are several iterations of what happened. I mean, it's such a fantastic story that, like, some people say that he, that someone else took a shit, and he, you know, like, smuggled that shit into them. Some people say that he, like, secretly took a shit in the communal toilet and then was his mom smuggled him like fresh vegetables and stuff to like cleanse his system so when he actually did present his shit they couldn't find anything so there's like all these great stories i don't know exactly what happened look all this is to say that you know you've just given me a couple of iterations that um i never heard before oh, but really? <laughs> but i know that the base of the story is actually based on one of his quotes Okay, because the yeah. quote is in the album. Actually, you know what? I got the box set, so might as well dig it out. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what the quote is on the record. But oh, yeah. Uh, okay. yeah, what happened was that, um, you know, this stuff needed a um, reissue campaign. So Knitting Factory decides to put out this fucking excellent box set and has uh, none other than Questlove um, curate it. Expensive shit is on it. And teacher no teach me nonsense on it, and there's other stuff. So I figure instead of buying individual albums, let me just splash and do this properly. And it's like, you know, it's vinyl porn. It looks really nice, and it feels great to play around with this stuff. So uh, that's what I did, and they sound great. Uh, they can pre All of these records can be purchased individually, but they sound great. And uh, if you're looking into getting uh, into the Fela catalog, honestly, I think like Grant already said, just go straight and try any of them because they're all good. They're all good. Do you have now, a favorite, I'll... for example? Do I? Yeah. Gosh. No, not really. I mean, I think maybe that's one of my favorites. But I think also I am partial to Shakara. Okay. And I yeah. also really like um, uh, Original Sufferhead. Oh, yeah. Those are two other ones that I really like. I mean, the, Zombie's good know, too. The, he, they're all similar enough to where you're going to love Like, if you like it, 
You're going to love it. Like, it's anything that you find. Just put it on and do your thing, and it's, you're going to be, like, what I don't know what else to say about Phelan. Yeah, it's Get just, what you find, you know? he like, takes you there, and he puts you in a groove, and, you know, before you know it, uh... Uh, well, you know how it is, you know how it is, like just the drum is supposed to be kind of like a heartbeat. He just puts you in this kind of like rhythm and you start living and you just start adjusting yourself to that rhythm. There's this yeah. lock that happens with a lot of African music, but with Fela also, and the songs go on for a good while. So, um, well, Sam, I wanted to talk about, um, a couple other Afrobeat architects. Do it. Because... Fela, I think there are probably a lot of people that are watching the show that have some Fela, that know Fela. Okay. And I thought that it might be cool to shed a little light on some other actors in the Absolutely. space, right? Sure, go for it, man. So one that I pulled is this one. Sigun Buckner? Sigun Bucknor, yeah. Sigun Bucknor, okay. Right, and so Sigun Bucknor... Um, his actually his cousin was older than Fela and played with Fela when he was studying in 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 England. But his brother is named Wole, but he's from a musical family. And and while um, Fela was touring the U.S., okay, um, Seagun was playing Afrobeat in Africa, okay, in Nigeria, and he was doing stuff that. Like he, you know, bef I, some of the stories that I've read, if I can remember correctly, um, he was like, Fela was still in his soul suits and like doing his soul kind of act. And Seagun had, had decided to go more like no shirts, tribal, like cowrie shells and was doing, um, dancers and had multiple singers and this and so uh, Fela comes back and is doing his show as well in Nigeria and he sees Sigun and he's like wait a minute this dude is doing it right doing it straight up right like this is Afrobeat in a very good way and this is a record on, this one's on Vampy Soul Vamp oh great label yeah it is and there's there's one on Soundway as well this Love is the one them. I have, but you can find them both on Soundway and, and Vampy Soul. And this one's a two disc and it's, I don't know, it's got 12 or 15 songs. It's fucking great. I mean, it's, it's, it's just what you'd hope. It's in some ways it's, um, it ventures further away from that sort of traditional Fela sound where it's like bass and drums for, for, what seemed like sometimes for a really long time. Yeah, well, that's and, Tony and, Allen, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so this is more, this can sometimes lead into, actually, there's some great jazz stuff on this that you'd like. Like there's along the lines cool of... Stuff. You need to check that one out. And so the other one that I wanted to... Hold on, dude, hold on. What you're going to do okay. is you're going to hang on because now I have to tell a story. What's happening here is that I'm so excited about this show. I'm having such a bloody good time that it's like, good. oh, dude, you have to, you have to. Look, honestly, to me... You can't. You have to. You have to mention William Onyabor, okay? Because oh, please, just please talk about William Onyabor. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. Do you have that compilation? Who is William Onyabor? No. Okay. Well, it's basically a three LP compilation, which really wasn't expensive at all. But on David Burns' label, which is uh, what that Luaka Bop. I just keep yeah. forgetting it, but Luaka Bop, right? And uh, David Byrne. Um, always was into kind of like the international music you know he toured with uh, peter gabriel on womad where a lot of people like king sane ade got known for the first time peter gabriel uh brought the yusun door from senegal you know on his soul tour so all of these guys were kind of into that entire scene and um david byrne uh curates a lot of that type of music uh there's a, a label called real world I, I, I that, that 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 releases a whole lot of international music. That's him also. Okay. He's behind that, right? I believe. Okay. And um, so he puts out this record. Who is William Onyabor? And honestly, the price was right. The cover was striking to me. Just this cowboy with a big old smile, with this you right. know crossing his arms, big cowboy hat. You know, pretty flashy and a big red cover. It wasn't expensive. I took it home, and I got the same kind of feel as I did from. Fela in the sense that the songs went on and on and on. Right. But um, 
it was in terms of happy meter, it was um fucking fail on crack times ten. It's yeah. it, it, it's like it, it it's the it, it's the equivalent of a sugar rush of a sugar overload. It's overwhelmingly happy music, and um, I just found myself playing this William Anyabor over and over. And I mean, since I got it, I still just always play it. But uh, if there was one compilation that I would tell people to get out of Africa, that's really out there, right? Because always operating under the lens of we'd like to talk about records that you can actually buy. They're available. This one out right. on Luwaka Bop is available. As a matter of fact, Luwaka Bop went further and released three box sets of William Anyabor stuff. Also very affordable. And I believe they went out and released every single album individually and this is Dude, stuff I, I missed the train i need all that stuff i Dude, need all that i stuff. promise number like i said they're not expensive but if you just yeah. had to start who is william anya man three lp it's got every it, it, it's it's fucking brilliant i'll it's have it perfect. don't worry i'll have it one day you know? i'll have it and when they did a documentary on him right because they did a documentary now the way he got all of this really expensive... I'm not going to go too deeply into it, but the way he got all of this really expensive into Af- expensive equipment into Africa is he used to po- he used to be a filmmaker and somehow got involved with some, th- some people in Russia and came back to Africa with a whole bunch of synthesizers because he decided not to do films, but he decided he was going to do music now and just came back with the most modern mics and synths, just tons of this stuff. Yeah. And- took these modern instruments and made African music like I never heard before. Purely electronic, but, uh, I mean, how do you describe Oh, man, man, those 70s, like, 70s African synth stuff is and organ stuff is just, like, just mind-blowingly wild. Like, what I know, like... There are a few other, like, there are some other ones. Ada, what's his name? Uh, Adakara Manu, I think, is one, and his electro. Well, no, shit, I can't remember his name. Anyway, sound engineer. Yeah, there's there's Adakara Manu and his and his sound engineers, and that's another one that's proto high life, electro high life. Like, it's 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 so cool. It's like nothing you ever heard. You know, it's just totally foreign, but it but it grooves so hard. Actually, there's another one. You see. I didn't know we were going to go into the electronic stuff at all, but I, I guess might as, well, my, might as well, right? Yeah, <laughs> Listen, sure. I can go there too, let's, right? Let's Manu, Ma, Manu right? Dimango, uh, Tidal Waves Music uh, sends us yeah. their promo, right? So when Manu Dimango, uh, they, they release, wow, man, the stuff they release is just great. They started releasing a lot of Popol Vuh and a lot of the uh, kraut rock stuff and uh, just excellent deep catalog but one of the records that they released recently late in 2017 was um mano dibango's uh electric africa okay right. now in terms of popularizing african music mano dibango is probably the big breakout star with soul Mokosa, wouldn't you say who me what wouldn't you say that Soul Makosa, Manu Dibango was really the yeah, album oh that God, are you kidding me? That's like one that of my brought the music over. Oh yeah, I mean that one. We I didn't even put that in. I, I meant to send that as one of our pop market picks. I don't know if it's even currently available, but like fucking grab that record the moment you see that record. It's the best, one of the best records in the I mean, entire universe. I can't think of an artist that came before him that really became an international superstar. And Manu Dibango was that. I mean, you know, the funk artists here were very, very deeply influenced by what was happening there. And if you notice at that point, when you start uh, looking at the history of funk music or the history of black culture here in Af- uh, in the United States, you notice that a lot of stuff like the black exploitation or the way they dressed started veering towards the African. Again, you always trace it back to James Brown, his vi- Muhammad Ali, you know, the rumble in the jungle, Zaire, right? And sure. all of a sudden you see Shaft going to Africa. So Shaft in Africa is out. And Superfly TNT has uh, you know a band from africa osabissa do the soundtrack and all of the american music is mirroring exactly what james brown was mirroring to them you know what i'm saying it is yeah soul music man it's there's so much soul music in fact i pulled one of my 
one of this this awesome compilation. When is it from? Last year. This Hot Casa Togo Soul. This has got um, Roger Damawuzan on it, who basically was the James Brown of Togo. What label is that? West Africa, even. Yeah, this has got some. Oh man, this. By the way, this is another one that like get this one. It, this has a bunch of seven inches that I looked for forever. For years and years. Okay. A Kofa Kosa, Bella Bello. What label? More. Like this one is this one. Label, dude. On You're breaking the bones in my brain. What label is it on? I want on to Hot, buy. Huh? This is on this is on Hot Casa, which is one of my favorite African labels because they do it so right. They they do so many Never heard. um full like full love reissues. Like they, you know, they just grab a single record and they, they have a lot of they do compilations too, but they, you know, for someone like me in particular, or someone who wants to dig deeper into African stuff, Hot Casa just has done a great job, man. I, I, I think they're like 15 years old now, and they just their catalog is, I just love it. So it's just, like that. It's like Hot Casa, Soundway. Yeah, I buy a lot of Soundway. <laughs> you know, those are the those are some of the big ones that if you're gonna if you have reservations if you find something on those record labels like well, just trust in those yeah actually you know i'll even like i said I'll, I'll because i have the record i can certainly talk about it but you know how we talk about the african and uh the african and american influence and in, uh, go back and forth just to round it off back to the electro um the electro afro stuff mano di bango yeah. on this particular record electric africa uh this was released just after uh you know Herbie Hancock basically changed fucking music completely with Rocket. What label is that on? That's Tidal Waves, dude. It's freaking Electric awesome. Electric Africa? I'm sorry? Electric Africa? It's Electric Africa, right? So as yeah. much as, like, let's say Soul Makosa, right? Soul Makosa, right. maybe one of the breakthrough things that happened was because of, and I mean, I'm, I'm certain that the fight in Zaire had something to do with it, but just the fact that those cultures were now being brought together and the artists were kind of, like, bringing that together, I think that it just created this art, this back and forth that, um, you know, um, Mano de Bango brought with Sol Makosa. He brought the James Brown and brought it, you know, with a strong African beat. And what he does years later in the 80s, after Herbie Hancock puts out Rocket, is he does the same fucking thing with uh, this kind of like crazy synth stuff. So a lot of what's on this is like um, Herbie Hancock Rocket. I, mean, I forgot what record it's on because I don't own the record. I'm still looking. Man, he does. He he kept up with the pulse of the world his entire career. Like he, you know, he did soundtracks. He, I, I think as far as one African artist that I'd love to see a huge comprehensive box set like the Fela box sets. Yeah, it's Manu, man. It's it's because his his career is so vast and spreading, and it's always changing. And he worked on, like, you know, he would write music for up-and-coming artists. Uh, one of my favorites is a, a Bella Bella 7-inch that he did that's just straight up, like, you know, acid soul kind of thing. I mean, he did everything. He did everything. And his, go look on Discogs or something. Go look at the amount of music that he put out in his career. It's in vast, and it's all very cool. I bought a soundtrack purely like blind pick i don't even know what label it's on but i bought a soundtrack called black goddess purely yeah based on the africa fact what sorry i think it might be on africa seven they reissued that i believe yeah i bought that i bought that in berlin uh cool. and just based on the fact that it's just a soundtrack from the 70s black and white cover black and white cover really really rough uh imagery like a, a rough design doesn't look very nice at all but it's pretty great. Yeah. You know the one I'm talking about, I guess, right? I think so. I, unless, yeah, I, I might have it mis, uh, just jumbled up in my head. But I think I know the one you're talking about. Wow, dude. Um, let's see. Hey, can we talk about Sorry Bomba? Yeah, do it. Okay. So I got really excited because 
I just read that Sorry Bamba, Dumali, his first album is being reissued on, apparently on Songhoi Records, which is the uh, original 70s label that his stuff was put out on. Okay. It's a French label. Uh, but the, the other two I have here, the other two um, were put out by Africa 7. Here's one of them. That's his third, and that's his second. Uh, but this stuff you may come across and it's, it's, uh, so he's, he's, um, he's from Mali and he's part of the Dogon tribe and the Dogons are the ones who were visited by aliens like thousands of years ago. Awesome. And, um, they, the aliens told them they were, they were the lizard people. And so you may have heard of like David Icke tells all these stories about the Dogons and the lizard people, the lizard race that lives here. The Dogons were visited by the lizard race and they were told where in the sky um, Sirius A and B, I believe, the, the stars maybe, where they were in the sky, but there was no uh, uh, way to view these stars until Galileo hundreds of years later and he indeed did confirm that these stars were where the Dogons were saying they were and they were so so anyway that I knew that story because my dad's would tell me about it but anyway I when I Interesting learned dad. about Sorry Bamba being a part of that tribe I was like, oh, I've got to find out. I've got to find out what this is, what this is about, right? That Shit sounds like straight up, it sounds like you described the African Raelians. <laughs> yeah. Well, so so this is very cool. Look, this this record here starts out with ball, 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 but um, ball, 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 but um, but um, ball, ball, ball. But um, like it's 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 heavy grooving and he and he give me the label a lot of, give me the uh, label on that again man yeah these are both on Africa Seven Africa Seven what the uh, what country are, do the do you know what country they operate out of Africa Seven uh <laughs> no let's see I don't oh They're well all off song way so that's French the original label is French I know the third the 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 first record, which is now finally getting its reissue, which is kind of the trilogy of the three. I'm waiting on number one here, but um, that, yeah, I don't know. I know that, that I had a hard time getting this one in the U S for a while. It was a, uh, it was a European first kind of thing, which happens gotcha. so often in the African market. Like I see all this awesome reissue stuff and I'm just like, well, I'm not paying 10 bucks to get it shift here you know hopefully it'll sell enough and come i mean that's that's a whole another discussion about like the well, way look, that we are not properly i don't know what is it are we not like are american markets not buying this stuff or no nah, look i mean i think a lot of this stuff now is international market and uh you know, if there's distribution, if there's distribution on both sides of the pond, then the records are readily available. Actually, it kind of does bring back uh, to exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, one thing that we take great pride in, listen, I know I do. For me, it's a big thing is if I'm if we're going to introduce records to you, uh, we want it to be stuff that we like. We want it to be stuff that we have. So uh, when we're going to put together the pop market shop. Uh, there might be stuff that might be available, like a lot of the, for example, the love, peace, and poetry stuff is available, but there are some compilations that were not available anymore, and it's not going to stop us from talking about it. I mean, if something, you know, if we get into something through another record, we will, but we try as much as possible to keep it current because, well, we want to help the labels out, we want to see as much of this African music really um, get spoken about, get purchased, because it's, you know... Who doesn't understand the drum, man? What's well, no, heartbeat? that was the thing. Was like, you know, I, I, I think one of the like dilemmas that I had was I want to talk about stuff that people can get. Yeah. And like, you know, and it's but important. there are so many small, small labels and small presses. I'm hoping that through this show, you know, and us talking about these things, that 
we can generate more interest and we can possibly even like, you know, excite some labels to say, oh, there probably is a bigger market than, than, sure than maybe is. we're estimating and, and maybe press more and send Look, them this way because it's all a big community. Okay. A lot, it's just right. The thing is, is that people have to buy these records. And it's not just about the music. It isn't. We're selling these. The, the people are spending money on this stuff. Um, and it's important to be able to talk about exactly that. You can't just talk about a simulation. You can't talk about a stream. It's not honest. The message becomes disingenuous. Now, where it is that we've had a bit of difficulty is in putting together a show like this. You know, you try to reach out and say, look, we love to talk about records. You got only so much money. I got only so much money. The show got 645,000 views last month. So people are watching. Okay. We try to be as honest as possible in the way that we talk about this stuff. And the reason it is that I chose Grant, for example, to fill in is because I knew he'd be able to be good because you can't fake it. If you love the stuff, you get excited about it. And every time Grant talks about Africa, every time he posts something on the forum, he's excited. The guy knows what he's talking about. So, hey, why don't we have him talk to you? I hope you guys liked it, man. What did you think? Yeah, I had a great time, man. You were awesome, man. Actually, it was really fun, you know, because um, at one point, I mean, you're going to see it only on the replay, but at one point, I just kind of basically sat back and listened to it because I enjoy the stories, and really, that's what the entire vinyl experience is supposed to be, just being able to enjoy the stories. And um, I'm really glad you did this with me, man. And uh, hey, Man, let's do it again. We'll talk, you know. We've scratched the surface, I feel like. You well, know? Look, why don't we I ask the audience? Movie. Pretty simple. Do you guys want to see more Africa shows? Do you want to see more themed shows? I mean, you know, we can do a reggae show pretty easily. I'd like to do a metal show. You know, is that the type of thing that you'd be into? That doesn't mean that we're not going to go into a bunch of other areas, you know, but it's just a question of focusing a little bit. For me, if we're able to even help out the labels or if we're able to help out indies, for example, you know, that... Yeah. You know, just by talking about the music, we're happy to do I, it. But I love that idea. But we don't that. talk about stuff we don't have. We can't. If I don't have a car, I can't do a car review. My opinion on Ferrari don't mean shit. I've never driven a Ferrari. So it's frustrating. Some of the labels don't understand that. But for us, it doesn't matter. You know why? Because the audience is what matters. That's what we're here for. We serve you. Okay. So what I'm saying is that when we talk about records, they're records we own. We have them. Okay, why? Because you need to know what the liner notes are like, what they sound like, a whole bunch of things. So we will not fake the funk. Dude, again, thanks for doing this, man. This was a great time. I had a great time, Sam. Thank you. All right, man. So uh, let's see what goes on. And uh, you guys, if you have any questions, me and Grant will be around. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know about you, but I want to take part of the, in the conversation. And uh, give us until Monday, and we will put up the new pop market store where you can actually uh shop some of this stuff all right catch all you right. later